This week, Bob Erdman, Associate Director of Development at Core Security, joins us for an interview to talk about building a risk-based vulnerability management program. Next up, Jim Langevin, U.S. Congressman at the U.S. House of Representatives, joins us for a discussion on Biden administration's EO on cyber. In the security news, Pingback is back. Was ever really gone? Damn QNAP ransomware, anti-anti porn software, Qualcomm vulnerabilities, spreading pandas on Discord, the always popular Chinese APTs, exploits you should be concerned about, job expectations, we steal your cryptocurrency, quick and dirty Python without lists, new Spectre attacks, GitHub says don't post evil malware, and more. All that and more on this episode of Paul's Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady, it's Paul's Security Weekly. Cyber criminals are using social engineering loaded with urgency and fear to successfully prey on victims, your employees, or your customers. Protect your Office 365 email from today's most sophisticated attacks with Barracuda Email Threat Scanner. It's a free tool to help protect your business from these hard to detect attacks. The Barracuda Email Threat Scanner uses artificial intelligence to hunt and eliminate Office 365 email threats. Find the cybersecurity threats hiding in your Office 365 email right now. Get your free email threat scan at securityweekly.com forward slash barracuda and welcome to the show but first let me introduce you to a man whose clapback is a pingback mr paul asadoria welcome everyone to paul's security weekly it's episode 693 recorded on may 6th 2021 right here in g unit studios in rhode island to my left mr larry pesce he's Woo-hoo. here with us yes yes that i am welcome larry What's going on? It's good to be here. We'll, uh, we'll see how I feel next week. We have our uh, second Pfizer dose. Oh, your second Fauci ouchie. My second Fauci ouchie. <laughs> and uh, on Wednesday at like 5.30 at night. Yeah. So I think Thursday is going to be a little hurting. But right. Yeah. You don't get much of a choice in the times, but you know, I'm not complaining. Yeah, you right, deal I mean, with it. I mean, we, we, we had some choice in the time. It was originally supposed to be Monday, but we had to drive an hour. Yeah. Um, yep. Hour there and an hour back um, to for Pfizer, but uh, we found in the meantime that a ton of appointments opened up significantly closer. Right, uh, you're right down here in, uh, in Johnston. No, nice. Which is way closer to us than yes. an hour. Um, and they had 1,800 appointments. Oh, that's like, awesome. So we got to pick the time, which just happened to be after work and after mm. kids' activities, and yeah, we were already going to be out to do stuff. So good stuff. Dr. Yep. Doug White is with us remotely. The, for the first yeah. time. The first time ever I was remote. I, I've always been in the studio, so I had to be remote. I got my second Pfizer yesterday, and I had all those dreams about Bill Gates licking my eyebrows and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> and um, But the, I, I'm okay now. I had a little bit of a headache, so uh, but I, I, feel, I feel like empowered, but I, it may be one of those bitten by a radioactive ladybug or something kind of thing. It's just, that's that's just the 5G routing table starting to form. Is that what it is? Yep. Yeah, it's starting. Yeah. starting, Bill, starting Bill and Melinda are getting divorced. Did you yeah, the, I mean, I the, saw that. The, the queen is now a widow. Bill's divorced. Just saying. It's just <laughs> that's a power couple <laughs> well, right there. I know. I was having those kind of thoughts earlier today <laughs> about like you know, Bill. Bill is now available, and maybe I should give him a call because you know now's the time. Yeah, I think I, he wants to hear from you, Doug. I mean, I hear he can hook you up with a free TechNet subscription. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. And Lee all the Neely. windows in tea you can use. That's it. Mr. Lee Neely's here with us. Lee, welcome. Ah, uh, good to be here. Not running any NT in this house, but you know, probably, uh, probably other places. Uh, looking for some fun. You know, hey, we got a nice, beautiful weather out here. I hope you're having nice weather back there. We're in the mid 80s right now. Oh, that's Crazy. that's some serious warm weather. Yeah, we're not that quite warm here, but. We're just getting warmed up here tonight on the show. Security Weekly listeners save $100 on their RSA Conference Pass for 2021. It is an all-access pass. RSA Conference will be fully virtual experience from May 17th through the 20th, uh, this year, of course. Security Weekly will be live streaming Monday through Thursday in Virtual Broadcast Alley, interviewing some of the top sponsors and speakers for the event. To register, please use, please visit securityweekly.com forward slash RSAC 
2021 and use the code 5U1Cyber. We hope to virtually see you there. Drink. This segment is sponsored by Core Security. To learn more, please visit securityweekly.com forward slash core security. Bob Erdman has more than 25 years of experience in information technology. He has worked with global customers across government, healthcare, finance, and military to help implement mission-critical technology. He joins us today to talk about building a risk-based vulnerability management program. Bob, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you. Great to be here. Excited to talk. Yes, it's uh, it's nice to have you uh, back on the show. You, have you been on this show before, right, Bob? Is that... Is that true? Not no. on this one. I've been on the uh, the short one, the roll wrap up. Yeah. Okay. I got gotcha. you. Awesome. Well, welcome to Paul Security Weekly, Bob. How did um? I just want to delve a little <clears throat> bit into uh, kind of how you got your start in information security. I got in the uh, hard way or or easy way, I guess. So I was running QA, and we sold a big deal to the military. QA guy, go to the lab, make it pass, and make them happy. So. I got introduced to security in the DoD running STIGs and uh, just kind of fell into it from there, kept working with the government, uh, major medical centers, financial institutions, and more and more over the years, I just kind of became a security program guy. Um, so I started managing security products, offensive and defensive side, and now I feel old, um, having started on the way, way back machine Unix, but it's great to still be around in the industry. Fantastic. And now, core security has a special very special relationship with the show, but it's part of a, a much like Security Weekly is part of a conglomerate mm -hmm. of companies. Core Security is also part of now a conglomerate uh, of, of companies. It is. Uh, Core Security is part of Help Systems. That is our parent. So uh, besides Core Security, uh, Cobalt Strike, Digital Defense, uh, Go Anywhere, Automate, uh, File Catalyst, Global Scape. The list changes almost every day. It's We're quite the list of leaps and bounds. Yeah, it's quite the list of. Uh, is it uh, RPA, robotic <laughs> process automation, is is a big part of your portfolio? That was interesting. That is yes, uh, automate and uh, jams. The, their sister company both are big in the RPA space. So that is a great way for us to be able to introduce new capabilities. Of course, because we have our own in-house automation teams. Whenever we yeah. want to do. Uh, things like that, we can pull in the things we already know. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And uh, recently you picked up a digital defense vulnerability scanning company, and previous to that, Cobalt Strike, who many of us knew and, and used in the industry. <clears throat> we did. And in between those, uh, File Catalyst, uh, mm -hmm. Bolden James, and Titus, all on the uh, data security and um, high-speed over-the-wire transfers. Uh, with file catalysts so it's really interesting mix that we have yeah that's that's really yeah i was kind of, i was impressed with the portfolio i'm like wow there's some of the things i haven't hadn't even uh to be honest with you i hadn't heard of before which is why i wanted to describe some of that for <laughs> uh our listeners so that's really cool um today we're talking about a risk-based vulnerability management program which seems to be like this catchphrase this sounds like, oh, like you should have a risk-based vulnerability management program, but it's not necessarily an easy thing to accomplish. No, it's really not. There's a lot of different things that you need to do as you're working your way from you know, the baseline where we find a lot of people, which is either no scanning or ad hoc scanning, you know, moving forward to where you are working in a more, you know, uh, better methods, you're doing more active scanning, you're starting to patch your high vulnerabilities to really start to incorporate the contextual risk around that to the business. You know, what in my environment is the highest priority for me to patch because, you know, we can't walk out and have a thousand vulnerabilities every week and expect our teams are actually going to get any of those closed. We know it doesn't happen. Things stay open for a really long time. So beginning to look at what is the most risky to our business, where do we need to concentrate first, allows us to be much more effective in our patch programs and bring down that risk overall to the company over time as we look at you know cyber insurance cost of our breaches and and all the different things around that what are what are the most common factors that you found bob that people are using to classify risk you know kind of right or wrong or indifferent most commonly you know we see people just basically going off of the the cvss score so i'm going to just try and hit my tens maybe hit my nines yeah and then it's already next month and i'm going to go back and hit my tens again depending on what's coming up that's not always necessarily you know the number one factor you have to worry about 
as we start to look at the business context around the systems, maybe what, what the compliance ramifications around some of our servers are, threat potential. So you know, we're not just starting with, what is it, a little over 120,000 vulnerabilities out in the wild today. You know, bring it down to what's discoverable inside of our environments. What are we actually finding that you have that brings us down to a much solid subset? And then what really are the critical and high risk things within that group? And then, honestly, what's actively being exploited? Because the biggest things we need to worry about are high risk systems that have vulnerabilities that are actively being exploited. That really helps us shrink that window down of what we want to concentrate on, patch that bad stuff first, and then let us expand out from there and move along. I find it fascinating that still, I guess because we sit here up on a pulpit and we're like, everyone should look at all these different factors and, and prioritize that way. I find it <clears> fascinating <throat> that still people just fall back to the, the CVSS score, which doesn't tell the whole story, right? It doesn't, but it's easy. Mm. You know, it's, it's a single list to look at. And I'm just going to go grab the numbers you know, and work that way. It's, it's a little, lot harder to get the rest of this around it. Sometimes it takes multiple tools and really having a way to not only get my list, which is the first big challenge, and we actually see more than we'd like to, you know, how many assets do I even have on the network? The first contact and we say, how big is your system? So let's just help you scale. We don't really know. How about you run a scan and tell me what you saw? You know, that's the first problem with just discovering what people have, what came in from shadow IT, what got plugged in yesterday that um, hasn't really been brought into the inventory systems yet. And then moving on after we discover vulnerabilities to actually be out and test those and see which ones are exploitable, which ones can we reach, which ones can an attacker go ahead and poke a hole in. And then, you know, do we hit a brick wall or do we hit the soft creamy filling of the network? You know, we want to prioritize based on the risk to those systems first. I feel like so much of that can be automated today, right? Because I, I feel like when like when we first started the show and, and prior to that, it really was more of a human craft to be able to identify vulnerabilities, know which ones were most exploitable, know where to find the exploits and to go exploit it. I think you fast forward to today, and, and much of that can be largely automated. You know, it, It's interesting you have businesses in products in, in the automation space as well, but... <laughs> You know, automated with kind of like that human touch in the process. You're right. Automated with the human touch to make sure that, you know, nothing too dangerous is going to happen. And, and it really goes around to the appetite for the business for the risk. I mean, we've dealt with companies in the past where, you know, if it isn't broken, I don't want to fix it. Leave it alone. Let it be. Others where we had really good um, inventories, really good baselines. We check for patches every day. And you know, we evaluated the risk and the SLAs and the downtime possibilities with fallback. And it was riskier to leave unpatched vulnerabilities in those systems than it was to just patch them and accept that occasionally we might run into a problem. So as we go through and do our vulnerability scanning, we bring in contextual threat operations and what's going on around the wild, wild internet. You know, we have threat research teams and dedicated vulnerability researchers that are looking outside what's happening there. And then we can pull in the automated pen testing behind that and actually turn around and try and pivot on those vulnerabilities and show which ones can be exploited, you know, increase that risk score for the ones that can and be able to actually show the business. If I broke through this, this is where I can get, this is what it might cost you, you know, when somebody steals that database in the background and help to bring that up forward and move that down the process. And so the, the vulnerability scanning component uh, recently came from the uh, Digital Defense Acquisition, mm -hmm. is that correct? It did. It's um, about eight weeks ago, actually. It's mm -hmm. really fairly new. So we're super excited to have that. That's been a, uh, we partnered for a long time with a lot of the other uh, vendors. Everybody mm -hmm. knows the big three, lots of them underneath, uh, web app scanners as well. And now having that capability in-house allows us to have an even tighter integration and do a lot more um, around this to bring that automation forward. So we really can bring vulnerability management um, to the masses, essentially. It doesn't matter how big your team is. You may be 200 people, you may be two people. We can still support the same methodologies, give you the same kind of capabilities and just make it easy for you to use that at the scale that you need it. And so, because I worked in vulnerability management, the digital defense, mm -hmm. they developed their own scanner from the ground up? <clears throat> they did. They built their own scanner from the ground up. They actually built their own fingerprinting as well. So mm -hmm. uh, they're using their own fingerprinting probes and their own methods around that. And then we um, 
they have their, a threat intelligence pipeline. Uh, we brought along a much, a very big one as well with core security, our threat intelligence pipeline. And it allows us to put a lot more context around the different things and understanding what's going on and what types of threat actors are working with which vulnerabilities in the area. Mm. So that lets us bring that context to the data so we can really help you score those. And then we've also made it very easy for people to add their own risk scores. Um, that was one thing that Digital Defense saw early on. I want to be able to mark the important systems to me and bring those higher up in the ranks. So it's not just that system A has a CVS 10. System A is very important to me, and I want that to bump up above system B so I can help use that inside of my prioritization as well. I like that, um, and I haven't tested the product yet, but we do some of that here at Cyber Risk Alliance, uh, actually. Uh, and vulnerable scanning is, is, up, is up next, uh, you know, sneak preview. It's what Adrian and I and team are, are working on. And um, I, the fingerprints are one thing that Adrian and I both kind of like to uh, really get up on our soapbox about because there are a lot of solutions that we see that incorrectly fingerprint things that are very easy to fingerprint. Ubiquity Gear is an example. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got some software that, uh, you know, we test. We haven't even done the test here. This is just like stuff we're running across. <laughs> They like won't identify it as ubiquity, and we're like, dude, like really, like you could probably just pull the MAC address and get that it's ubiquity. Um, and so, it, and obviously, the the fingerprinting was a, a huge, you know, part of you guys acquired the the company. I'm assuming they have their own research teams that are doing a better job than most, from what I've seen, in doing that fingerprinting because it's important. They do have a very large research team in doing that, and we're we're super excited. You know, inside of our penetration testing tools, Core Impact, we also mm -hmm. have fingerprinting capabilities and we do it differently. Mm -hmm. And it's great to be able to merge the two methods together, take the best of both sides and, and make sure that we're all working on the best data that we can. Uh, very similar with our attack path mapping. We have an attack path map inside of our pen test tools. DDI also has an attack path mapping inside of the bone scanners. So, you know, if somebody pops system A, what's behind it, what can I see? And as we marry these things together, we're really able to get that economy of scale, show the same types of data in different contexts, be it volume scanning, pen testing, or just plain old network mapping um, that we also have that can do its own figure printing. So we've got a lot of experience around this now, and we've really gotten very good at it. I'd imagine, Bob, that you're uh, in the next logical question, I think probably on my mind and many others, is you're going to marry these two tools together so that I can vuln scan and it goes, hey, there's a vulnerability and it goes off to core impact or, you know, core suite of tools and goes, I'm going to go exploit that and I'm going to include the full thing right in the report, right? Absolutely. That, that is where we're um, working on right now. And not only from the vulnerability scanner side, but what if I'm the guy running the pen tests? I want to poke the button and have a uh, frontline go out and give me everything it can about that system as part of my information gathering so that I can import that in as part of my testing. So making that real tight two-way integration is going to help us a lot with being more effective on both areas as we move forward, you know, and then bringing in all of our threat research and their extra data as well helps us put that context around it and really understand how something could be utilized maliciously inside of the network. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a great, great, great strategy. I, I, I always loved the core impact agent. I thought some of the best, one of the best payloads probably still today that I've seen. I think it's really cool. Does it still have the Alex's, voice? Alex's voice? Yes. It still does. It's still <laughs> the same one. It's awesome. And, uh, we need another recording, though, because now, of course, we interoperate with Cobalt Strike, so we can drop beacons from impact agents. Uh, we can session crash from Cobalt Strike beacons down into impact and drop agents out of the beacons. So we're really starting to build a lot of that interoperability between all of the tools in the suite. <clears throat> nice. Lee, you had a question? So as I, I was thinking about the, 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 the whole... Um, I was back thinking about CVSS and everything you've got in here. And I remember going through the, 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 you know, adding the context to the CVSS three scores and it was kind of a bitch. And I'm wondering, you know, can you characterize with the tools you bring to the table? Are people actually making a using, using the risk scoring to modify the scoring and they're not just going, I mean, Ooh. The, the shift in mm -hmm. your character. I, I like that. I, I want to just uh, build it up for one second, Bob. And the question is mm -hmm. that I do the vuln scan, I exploit the vulnerability, 
I deploy the core impact agent, I collect all that data, and then I come back and I modify my, my risk score, my CVSS score, based on that telemetry that I've collected. Mm -hmm. Ooh, I like that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And um, even before that, uh, some of the scanners are actually modifying it just because core impact has an active exploit. Right. So the first step is we could exploit it. And then of course the next step is we did, and here's all the information that we gathered. And as people are um, exposing that, I mean, I think one of the big things that we saw was, you know, moving to CVS3 was a lot of things went high and critical. It's, it's a much bigger pool than it used to be. You know, and, and that's where we really get to add those extra pieces. We do see a lot of people using the uh, personalized risk scoring. So I want to move up the threats on my DB service higher than the threats on my web service, for example. Uh, we also have peer grouping available. So as they're working over time, now I can go out and compare myself to as like industries, um, as like sizes of companies and see how I'm doing in that industry peer group. If I am falling behind, if I'm leading the pack and help me know if I'm doing enough to really work with those items that I should be. Does does all that Talk. does all that stuff uh, start to get into when we used to do controls? We used to rank them like low, medium, high risk on controls, and then start trying to kind of build out some sort of analytics. And it, and, and it went from very simple things where people just basically said, you know, high risk things we're going to fix, low risk mm -hmm. things we're going to accept. But I mean, I, I was always trying to push people towards more of, a, of an algorithm based idea where you do some statistical analysis and you start looking over time at, at how these different factors affect risk and loss and, and so forth. I mean, is that where we're going? I think that it is. And we're in that path already. We're building machine learning models around um, these different things to help predict that risk score and to help make a better decision tree for those end users. As we're working with those high, medium, lows, we're also keeping uh, what we call their security GPA. So essentially they got a report card growing or shrinking over time inside of their environment. So I can look today at where I stand based upon the systems in my environment. I can go back last month and look, am I going up? Am I going down? Create my diff reports, um, show management what we've done in the last 30 days, for example, to fix vulnerabilities as we move forward. So a uh, high risk vulnerability on a low impact system is not going to score necessarily as big as a medium vulnerability might on a very high risk system. And of course, it's going to affect our scores overall as we work that way. So we really do want to help them prioritize much better where they put their efforts as they move into that uh, farther down the line into the management model. Yeah, I mean, I was kind of naive when I first started looking at that stuff because I was kind of like, fix all this. And, you know, and that was when I got sort of hit back with, <laughs> we can't afford to, we don't have the time to. And it was like, wow. And that was really when I started thinking about how do I take all these spreadsheets and pivot tables and start saying, which one of these should I circle first? Because I had somebody, a, a, a CIO say, tell me the top three. And I was like, they're all important. And he was like, yeah, but what are the top three? We'll fix those. And, you know, it was like, uh... <laughs> So, yeah, I, I think that getting into more advanced a analytics that can show you these things, especially as they shift over time, as you put other things into the system, as you add controls, and trying to get a feel for how all that stuff interacts would, would really be valuable. It definitely is, and that's a good question for people to ask themselves. Do you know what your top 50 vulnerabilities are in your environment, or even your top 10, like you said? Uh, a lot of people really don't. They haven't done the time to figure out what are the crown jewels of their environment. If I am a malicious actor, what am I going after? How do I get there? How do I protect the systems in that attack path to uh, keep that piece of my network safe and make sure that those are the things that I'm prioritizing every patch cycle, making sure that those are the systems I'm looking at first and those, high, those highly um, vulnerable systems, the ones that have the most important data are always getting protected. And you can't always do it with um, active patches. You know, We all know you can't always reboot. You can't always apply a patch without breaking some application that somebody wrote. Sometimes it has to be a remediation step, maybe a virtual patch, or I'm gonna put a mitigation strategy in place I think one of the important things with that is generally we want to have some kind of a time limit upon that. So this um, you know, mitigation is great, but give me the schedule of when you're actually going to apply the recommended patch so that we can take the mitigation away now and show that we are fully patched at some point. Yeah, I mean, I, I got to where, you know, it turned into sort of a multivariate problem because 
and which which meant that it got out of everybody's hands real fast was that was that you know on the the dependent variable side the initial one that we looked at was loss so it was like you know did you experience losses related to this but then that turned into downtime so there was also that one and there was a whole bunch of other dependent variables and all that turned into a really complex algorithm really fast and you know and then that then you started losing them because they really want you to come in and say if you've put that patch on this all your troubles will be solved and that it was usually not that simple although Bob, sometimes it i wanted to ask a question about exploits too and because i think there's some nuanced uh things in there that i've i've learned especially in the past year about how to manage vulnerabilities and that is it's one thing for an exploit to exist or not it's another thing to measure whether or not that exploit is being seen in the wild. Does your threat intelligence also kind of add that second piece of like whether it's in the wild or not? It does. We're definitely looking at uh, threat actors, threat mm -hmm. actor groups, and what is out there in the wild. And I think um, also along with that is, can it actually be exploited in my environment? Yes. Um, not all exploits are equal. Some of them have very specific requirements just mm. because the exploit exists. You also have to have A, B, and C configured exactly the right way to have that exploit. Like, like in some of the exim vulnerabilities, right? It, it's like you have to have like 22 gigs of memory. In <laughs> exactly order. 22 yeah. gigs. Exactly 22 uh, gigs, yeah. So do you, when you're looking at, at exploits in the wild, are you differentiating between say uh, just a proof of concept that's been published versus something that's actually being used or are those same 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 uh, weighted no the, the things that are actually being used definitely bump up but how much they're being used who they're being used by um of course but proof of concept always starts the chain you know since we have our own uh, pen test teams our own uh, pen testing software. We, of course, have our own exploit writing team that does this um, every day. So we get a lot of good intelligence from them on what works, what doesn't work, um, as well as coming back in from our pen test teams, you know, be it a zero day that we're reporting or just something that, you know, got published by a research team. So we, we really get a lot of that. Um, how effective is this information from those pen test teams? You know, can you actually use this if you go hit somebody's corporate environment? Is this kind of pie in the sky that you never see it? Because honestly, most of the things we see getting exploited already have a patch. It, it's not zero days. It's mm -hmm. not the crazy things that are coming off the researchers. The majority of it is something that had a patch that didn't get applied or it had a misconfiguration on the system that opened a hole. Um, and that's really what we're trying to find is, you know, what are those things that you could have fixed already that you didn't? And how can we help you figure out which ones are the most important to get there first? So, you know, not just patches, but configuration as well. You know, be it, you know, if you're going SCAP, if you're going CIS, if you're going STIG, we just want to make sure that we're providing the right kind of information for you, the business that you're trying to run. Yeah, I think with the, the difference between a, a proof of concept and an actual exploit is whether or not the exploit team can put it in core impact, right? They love POCs because that's the first step. That just yeah. makes their job easier. Yeah. And they don't have to write the POC. Right. And if they can get it working, then it's in the framework. And then it automatically, I think, has a higher, you know, higher risk score. Yeah. And I think the other thing we see is people don't always consider the non-operating system um, vulnerabilities and exploits. Not everything is a Windows bug or a Linux bug. Yeah. You know, it may be a VPN. It may be something in your browser. Um, you mentioned Exum. You know, it may be something in the firmware in the back of your UPS. Mm. It's really hard to know. There's so many different places you need to look. So everything is important now. IoT, containers, operating systems, applications. And that really gets back into that discovery phase right from the start. What is actually in my network that I need to be concerned about um, so that I can make sure that I'm looking at that across the environment and what's being used the most. If I have an environment where three people are using something and a thousand people are using something else, you know, most likely the thousand are the one I want to look at first because that has a bigger attack surface for someone to go after. Yeah, <clears throat> Bob, you and I were having that conversation, and we've had it here on the show as well, is usage, right? How much usage, uh, it, not just usage, but like the number of instances of this software in my environment. And then if you can track how many people are using it, right, this ways to gather that telemetry, and then who's using it are all those little like nuanced things that go into how I prioritize <clears throat> what I'm going to fix first. Yeah, and if people aren't using it, why is it there? You know, that's one of the things yeah. that we have tried to do a lot of. If, if I don't need a service, I don't need a port, I don't need a package, get rid of it because that it decreases the amount of things you have to patch. 
if I didn't need that RPM, I can get it off my system. I don't have to ever worry about patching it again because it doesn't exist to me anymore. And the more and more we can limit that attack surface, the easier it is for us to actually maintain a good level of patching inside of these programs. Mm. Yeah, there's something to be said, I think, in, in security about, you know, controlling your attack surface and environment. And, and that stems from knowing what you have. <laughs> because you have to know about it before you can go, wait a minute, I want to standardize on this. Maybe that's not the most most secure thing or, you know, there's a lot of factors in there. But, like, look, this is what we're going to standardize. And this is what we're going to get good at discovering, finding, fixing, maintaining, and configuring correctly. I think that's really what where it's at when it comes to security. There is something to be said for that. If it is not able to be managed in the way that I want to manage it, generally, you know, our IT team doesn't want it on the network. Yeah. Even if it's not maybe everybody's favorite app, it's an app we can securely manage. That's the app we want to use. You kind of pick your poison, you know, it's essentially what it comes down to. I mean, we look at that with communication software and we look at that with browsers for sure. I mean, you got Skype, Zoom, Slack, Teams, all these different things. I mean, they all come with some inherent level of risk and you could analyze that risk, I think, until the cows came home. But like pick one and get good at, at deploying, installing, configuring and managing and patching that one. That's it. Yeah, build that baseline gold disk, increase what's on it if you need to for certain environments, but always try and live with that base image first. And that'll really help you limit what's out there. Mm. And maybe you have to build enclaves inside of your environment. You know, we certainly see that where certain groups of users need certain capabilities that others don't. You can lock down some areas more than you can lock down others, for example, because my exploit writers, they're writing code that is meant to do exploits and all of the vendors are trying to find that code. So we have to do different rules as we're developing things maybe over here than we would in our standard software development area, you know, where we could be much more judicious about what we go after. Um, so we are building different models for different areas and you can do that within the products, you know, and configure those systems to work in the way that you need to across your environments. Yeah. Um, also, Bob, I want to talk about web application scanning too. Because I think, you know, I'm starting to really draw some very distinct differences <clears throat> between the tools and tactics and techniques kind of on the flip side, on the defender side that you use on software that you're writing yourself versus software that you're kind of pulling off the shelf. Now, of, oftentimes software you write yourself, I mean, almost 100% of the time is including someone else's modules, but you're adding on your own code to that and you control the development process versus code such as, I use WordPress as an example. Mm -hmm. I'm taking that off the shelf. Sure, I'm adding plugins and all that stuff on, but that's something I'm not really developing myself, right? Custom React application to me is very different from a security perspective than, than WordPress. And I like using the automated scanners especially in, in as much automation as I can on the things I'm not writing myself. Because the stuff I write myself, I can build stuff at all these different stages in the application lifecycle. But for like WordPress, I, I want a scanner. Um, and, and Digital Defense has a web application functionality, is that correct? Core Impact does Did as well. Yes, both of them do actually. Digital Defense has a web application scanner. Uh, Core Impact, the pen test tool has its own web application scanner. You know, we can combine the data from both of them as we're working through these different environments. But more and more, that's what we're seeing people targeting with the uh, with their actual scans is actually starting to look at those web applications. And maybe even from the vendors that they've chosen, you, of course, want to do a little research on the vendor you're, you know, you're bringing in. Do we trust their SDLC? Are they doing something good? And of course, trust but verify them. Let's actually test that after we deploy it, you know, and see if it really meets the security standards we want in our environment. So we're, we really like having that in there. Um, having the capabilities to do you know authenticated and unauthenticated scans so we can reach in a little deeper for the places that we need to you know and being able to really utilize all of these tools in the tool chain to get the most valuable data that we can for the environments and then especially on the retest and we haven't really talked about that very much but it's not just applying a patch and knowing that you applied it at least you think you did you're not really sure how effective it is unless you actually go and check it mm. and that's where really where the pen testing piece comes in is we can actually go out and one touch validate that all of that work that you just did last month is actually effective the patches were applied and they're actually blocking the holes that we saw in the network so that we can know that we can move on because if we didn't we need to go back and do something either old artifacts were left on you know external things were there systems didn't get rebooted sometimes or maybe the patch just failed to apply 
So mm-hmm. we want to make sure that we're not only patching in our patch cycle, we want to come back on the other side behind that and test those patches and make sure that we've actually remediated the vulnerabilities. You know, not only that, one situation we run into here often at Security Weekly for compatibility reasons is I had to uninstall the new version and I had to put the old version back because stuff didn't work. <laughs> mm-hmm. right? And if you're not doing this continuous assessment, you're going to miss that. And there's windows where you're vulnerable. Now, there may be a very good reason why that happened. You know, in our case, uh, we need to do production because we're going live in like five minutes. And so if it doesn't work, like we're screwed. Mm-hmm. Therefore, we've got to uh, revert back to a previous version. And so you're going to want those compensating controls. And that's why I like the combination of both you know, vulnerability assessment and, and pen testing. Because, yeah, I might have back revved and the Vuln scanner still finding is vulnerable, but I may have added this other thing that makes it so much harder to exploit, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, for sure. We want to do defense in depth all the way around. Uh, we've seen that a lot with browsers. Something has been written in-house, and, and a lot of times this is in-house software that was built, and somebody isn't ready or isn't willing to take the time and the expense to move it forward to the next version. It's like, we are going to mandate old browser version X, because that's what works with the thing that we wrote. And if we let you upgrade, everything's going to break and the business doesn't run. So we have to put controls around that to help mitigate that you know possible damage until those things can be brought forward. Um, we'll see that a lot in the big backend iron as well. I wrote some big Unix app five years ago. Everything's running great, except that it's five years old and it's got a lot of security vulnerabilities now. You know, We have to make sure that the business can accept that risk or else they're going to have to bring forward the time and the materials to move that and make it less vulnerable and get it up to a later operating system now, something that is less risky overall and easier to manage. You know, I, I find it amazing that when you do find technology and configure it and build it in such a way that it works, from a security perspective, it's almost a negative because it's working. And I haven't had to look at it and really like do anything with it. I, I have a service running here um that was like well i haven't like used that in a while and i i like i hit the website it, it's internal right i, I hit it and it, it worked and cool. i was like cool i'm like but wait i haven't updated that container in like a really long time <laughs> and like now i'm like i don't wanna because it's working <laughs> Yeah, containers are getting bigger and bigger, and we're um, introducing container scanning inside of um, digital defense now mm-hmm. as well. Um, of course, you know, as people are moving to more of container deployments, we want to make sure that we can get in there and scan containers as we would any other object on the network and mm-hmm. make sure that there is not something that is insecure inside of those container images that they're going to start deploying. So bringing that into the pipeline and making sure that they're being treated the same respect that everything else is. Yeah, we were talking about that earlier in the week, Bob, that... A container is really, it's really just code, right? I mean, it really is not infrastructure as code as we typically think of it, but it's code that's creating that that environment. And I think it should be treated as such. Once you take that container and you push it out to Kubernetes or you push it out to some other cloud service or your Docker environments, like then that's more infrastructure security, right? Because it's all about scaling and spinning up and down. And you really have to keep those, I think those two things separate and can, Treat those containers more like your app and your code. Even if it's someone else's mm-hmm. app, you're still like you have a, a file that your the Docker file is essentially code that's piecing all that stuff together. That should be treated as code, scanned and analyzed, j- just like you would any other application. And a lot of times there is somebody else's code involved in that because you're yeah. pulling packages down and bringing them into your product or into your service rather than writing it yourself. So we have to make sure that those things are all secure as we bring those along. Yeah. It, it, and so my my example was um, Apache Guacamole, right? Guacamole is awesome, right? Like I can build a whole config and I can RDP and VNC into everything. I can put it in a web browser. We can access it from anywhere. It's great. Like, and I built that. Con- I, mean, I didn't really even build the container, right? Like I basically got the scripts from the Guacamole project and I'm like, oh, I can like spin up a <coughs> container and that's how I'm, I'm running it. And because it's Java based, right? So I'm like, I didn't want to mess with Java. So I'm like, there's a container. It runs Java, runs guacamole. It's great. But like, it runs so well. That's the example. Like, I haven't touched it in a while. And I'm sure a Vuln scanner would probably have a field day with it. <laughs> we see a lot of set it and forget it. Yeah. yeah. You're right, though. If, it, if it's working, people kind of forget that it's there in the background until something breaks. 
Yep. It's really t- it's really tough to tough to touch anything that's working that's in production. I, I mean, it it just even just a patch. You know, I mean, I had uh, just uh, the other day I had this server that's been running since 2005, so it was really really old. It was running Windows 2003 server, and it probably hadn't been patched in 10 years. But I was afraid to patch it because it supported uh, some of my Cisco management stuff that we patched once before and it fried everything and we couldn't run it and we had to roll everything back so it was one of those just leave it alone and isolate it but you know it's a huge threat <laughs> but fortunately yeah. it was very isolated yep now it's dusty those are the yeah. dusty corners someone yeah. described that to me as is once right like your job as a pen tester is to find those dusty corners mm-hmm. and that's also the you know those dusty corners are what where the good stuff is hiding right Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We found a we found a server in a firehouse one time that was it had no monitor, no keyboard, no nothing. It was under a pile of junk in a closet, and we were seeing it on the network. And people were using it to RDP into the network, but we didn't know where it was, and nobody could tell us. And we just had to keep. We literally traced it by wires, and we finally found that you know here's a wire that goes to the wall, and there's something. Uh, what's on the other side of the wall? And they're like, it's a storage closet. And we went over there and pulled. Bunch of old boots and stuff, and guess what? Sitting on the floor, server. And you know, I, I mean, as a security person, you want to be like, "Oh my god, this is an atrocity!" But then, like <laughs> the technology person, he was like, "Kind of like hats off to the person that built that that you could put it in a server under a bunch of boots and like no, <laughs> like that is the greatest technology mm-hmm. project ever. Like someone could just yeah. have, like forget about it. Like you know, our servers were like constantly blowing the dust out of them every once in a while. And that one, and that one had sweaty boot rash. Like, yeah, geez. yeah, exactly. And I mean, awesome. but I mean, when you start talking to IT people, when you go out as, as a security analyst mm-hmm. and you start talking to IT people, they get real, you know pissy about it because they're like look this works it's in production don't mess with it mm-hmm. it's, it's you know and and if you start messing with it and it crashes then you're going to get yelled at a whole lot and you know and when say, you mess with it it's 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 not going to work right well and you don't know what it's doing i mean the other problem as an auditor was you find those things and you see something pointing to this so you run a scan and it says look at this and look at this and look at this and it's really tough to get up to speed on what those things are doing and, and what services they provide and and often those customers did not know what it was they're just like i think that might be where we're getting email and you're like mm. you, think? <laughs> you know it's well it's like my famous story that you know there was uh uh, a Cray supercomputer at the university. And the only way they knew there was a hacker lurking in the Cray supercomputer is because that person was actually applying patches so that no one could exploit <laughs> the same holes to get in. Like, had they not applied the patches, it probably would have gone undetected for far longer, but they were applying patches because they're like, I don't want anyone else to, to get in where, where I'm in. And the, the sys admin knows I remember, I, I have talked to people about that before too, saying, you know, if mm. I broke into this server, I think that's exactly what I would do. I'd set up an account for myself, give it some funky name, and then patch the holes so nobody else could get in and kick me out. Right. But as we know, like some application, some job probably broke. And it was probably due to a patch that was being installed by the hacker. <laughs> well, it's there you go. <laughs> um, Bob, are you still having conversations today? Because we have a lot of conversations about when it's the right time for a pen test, when it's the right time for a vulnerability assessment. Now that you've got all both those products, uh, you know, in the portfolio, uh, is that conversations you're still having uh, with folks? It is. We get um, people coming in and you know, give me a pen test. I really want one, and we definitely start to ask them, you know, where are you at today? What does your landscape look like? And and some of the time we'll find out, you know, what you really need to do is do a vulnerability scan first, because if we're going to bring in our pen test team, they're just going to pawn you right away because you mm-hmm. haven't applied any patches in the last year and a half. You know, you really want to fix that low hanging fruit first and make it worth your while to have a vulnerability, you know, to have a pen test done. So run the vuln scan first and understand the difference. And we do see still sometimes people don't really get the difference between I'm checking for missing patches, misconfigurations versus I'm going in and trying to break into your system. We really want to make sure that they're getting the most out of their pen test. And to do that, they really need to do a vuln scan first. You know, if, if you're coming in and using the pen test service at Digital Defense, Vault scanning is part of the process. That's what they're using as well to deliver it. But we certainly advocate, you know, making sure that you patch yourself up before you ask for a pen test to make sure you're putting your best foot forward and making our guys earn their keep, you know, because we don't want to just go in and jump on some Windows XP box you forgot is in the closet. We want you to actually make sure things are set right. And then let's look 
you know, what we really have left over now that we can help expose for you so you can see where you need to go next. Mm. Absolutely. More questions, comments, topics? Bob, so, what else you, what, I, go ahead, Lee. So I was thinking as a little bit ago, we were talking about, you know, where we, you know, the, the, the five-year-old application, sophisticated application that we can't just fix. Can we set up something uh, so that we say, okay, we've given them six months to take care of this and we'll come back and scan it again? Automated kind of thing, alerts, um, or other mitigations? <laughs> What can we do? No, that's a great function to have, actually. So, um, especially inside of you know not only the vulnerability scanner, but uh, more importantly inside of the pen testing process. So, if we get a scan and do a scan report, we go out and run our pen test, use Core Impact, and and see what's there. And you go out and do your fixes. You set up your mitigation to your remediations, and then come back in 90 days. You can just click the retest button, and we'll replay that whole test sequence, and then show you what the differences are. Hopefully, they're all really good. Uh, sometimes they're not, but it'll let you do that one touch automation to validate everything that was done in between those scans so that you can show that difference over time. So are we, we, we coming back and rescanning with the same exact pro or are we scanning with the latest, uh, the latest profile or can we choose? Most people, honestly, in the real world are scanning with the latest because they're continually updating and adding additional exploits to the product. Uh, we're scanning with the exact same set of vulnerabilities, so nothing's really going to change for us there. Uh, we're going to hit the same things that we hit the last time, even though we've updated the product baseline a little bit with new things that could go out. Um, that's not part of that process. We're looking really at doing a, a one for one and showing you the difference. Yeah. Um, you of course then could go out and poke again and you should continually reassess your environments over time and make sure that nothing new has been opened up from the last time. Well, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, I've had that conversation where it's like, no, I want you to scan me with the exact same profile so that I can show that I fixed the exact fix. And I'm like, but, but, but there are new vulnerabilities and new exploits out there, guys, you're going to have to deal with them too. And uh, mm -hmm. it's, an, it's an interesting conversation to have. And we see yes. people doing it both ways. I mean, they really want to know how they worked from job to job. But then, you, of course, like you said, you also need to look at what changed. And sometimes the latest patch actually opened up some new bug that you have to deal with. That's just as important to find out after you've applied that patch. What now can I see on the network? Bob, are there uh, any new things that you want to talk about in terms of features across, you know, the security products uh, that you're ready to announce uh, tonight? Uh, I think the latest new thing that you're going to see inside of uh, Core Impact when we come out in our June release is that uh, live attack path mapping. Mm. Uh, so if you are familiar with the tool, it was a very uh, textual based host map uh, showing what you've done, where your agents are deployed, what you've found. And this new updated version is going to give you a, a graph view so you can see all of the discovered hosts in your network, the paths between them, you know, where you've moved around, if you've pivoted across the environment and be able to do um, live interaction with that as you're working along. So kind of mirroring up the functionality that was in Cobalt Strike with the graphical view that Cobalt Strike had. Um, we're continuing, of course, our interoperability with Cobalt Strike to add some new functionality and features there as we go along. And um, as we kind of bring our solutions together, uh, we're really, really working on a, a single pane of glass for an environment where um, with Help Systems One, which is our management plane that we're building, you can get into all of these different data views and different applications running from the same uh, product on there. So that's really going to allow us to uh, give people a single pane of glass to work with, role-based access control for what you're allowed to touch, uh, what you're allowed to see, but it brings it all into a single holistic environment for those end users. Um, the other thing we're working on is adding more machine learning. And we do have active uh, threat researchers and data collection you know, going every day. We're continually refining our machine learning and AI algorithms, and we're bringing more of that down now into the pen testing space so we can use it to make better decisions inside of the pen testing process of what we try and where we go next to better enable those um, you know, maybe junior or less skilled users or just you simply want to walk away for a bit and come back when it's ready for you to do your knowledge work to put even better automation inside of the product than it has today. So continuing to push that forward. Fantastic. 
Well, Bob, thank you so much for appearing on Paul Security Weekly this evening. Thank you for having me. It was great to be here. For folks who want to learn more, please visit securityweekly.com forward slash core security. Coming up next, U.S. Congressman Jim Langevin. Stay tuned. <laughs> 